There's no definitively proven single diet for MS, but this could be your best bet. Today, we'll take a look at a diet developed by Dr. Ashton Embry to treat his son with multiple sclerosis, Matt Embry. We'll look at the theoretical principles behind the diet and how to implement it. So to start, who are these people? This is Matt Embry, the son who has multiple sclerosis. He says in his youth, he had a poor diet, eating a lot of fast food, drinking soda, that kind of thing, and he was diagnosed with MS in 1995 at age 19, and his first symptoms were numbness in the foot spreading up to the chest with hypersensitivity. This is a typical symptom of transverse myelitis inflammation of the spine, a common first initial symptom of MS. MRI scan revealed lesions in the brain and spine, and he was diagnosed with MS. He read books by Dr. Roy Swank of Oregon Health Sciences University, who believed in a low saturated fat diet based on his observations of the risk of multiple sclerosis in different areas of Norway, where people living in inland areas who consume more beef and dairy had higher rates of MS. He also read works by Judy Graham, an early proponent of lifestyle in multiple sclerosis, and Judy later adopted what would become known as the best bet diet. He started some dietary changes introduced to him by his father, and this would later be known again as the best bet diet. His symptoms improved over about four months, though he had intermittent return of his symptoms. For instance, when he had the flu, this is a well-known phenomenon known as multiple sclerosis pseudo exacerbation, the recurrence of prior symptoms in the setting of rays of body temperature, such as illness and fever. But afterwards, he's been stable. And if you do the math, this is 2024, and so he could be in his late 40s by now. He's been stable for decades, and he apparently keeps the program very strictly, no cheat days, and is also exercises and is quite physically fit. Later, he's a filmmaker. He made the documentary Living Proof about his experience with multiple sclerosis and diet, and it's also a critique of the pharmaceutical industry. The father, Dr. Ashton Embry, is actually a Canadian geologist, a research scientist, and he has some publications related to studies in the Arctic, sedimentology, where different elements sediment over time, petroleum and fossils, and he's the developer of the Best Bet Diet, and he later started the charity Direct MS, which stands for Diet Research into the Cause and Treatment of Multiple Sclerosis, and there are a lot of free resources on their website, including a cookbook in the notes below. The rationale behind the diet is quite complex, but here are some of the general principles. One is molecular mimicry, the idea that some of the foods you eat could have a similar structure to components of myelin, the fatty sheath of the nerve fibers, and the main target of the immune system in the inflammatory component of multiple sclerosis. For instance, you eat certain foods, they have certain antigens or pieces of proteins that stimulate your immune system, and there's a cross-reaction against myelin causing injury to the central nervous system. The other concept is allergens. Some foods may have a greater propensity to cause a low-level allergic reaction. Not type 1 hypersensitivity like hives, wheezing, or anaphylaxis, but an insidious, invisible inflammation within the body which could rev up inflammation, and some foods may be more prone to this than others, and in fact, it could be idiosyncratic to each person, and they actually recommend getting an ELISA blood test to look for allergies you may not be aware of, though this may not be 100% accurate. The other concept is changes in the microbiome, the collection of different bacteria bacteria within the gastrointestinal tract. There's evidence this is changing in modern times, particularly with the increased consumption of processed foods and refined sugars. You can get different proportions of different types of bacteria, and you can also get overgrowth of yeast, and these changes can damage the gastrointestinal tract and increase the permeability, causing so-called leaky gut syndrome, allowing particles normally, which would not enter the bloodstream, to get get in. There's also the possibility that diet could contribute to injury to the blood-brain barrier. Normally, there's a barrier between your brain and the bloodstream preventing excessive extravasation of the immune system into the central nervous system. There's also evidence that modern diets have a disturbed omega-3 to omega-6 ratio.
ratio. This term is an organic chemistry term referring to fatty acids and the position of double bonds. And there's evidence that omega-6 fatty acids are more pro-inflammatory, and it may be better to change this to have a more favorable omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. Now we move to a few specific principles. One thing they recommend is a gluten-free diet. Gluten is a protein in wheat, barley, and rye. This is an old study published in 2004. They looked at people with MS, the top of the chart, versus controls without MS, and the levels of antibodies against gliadin and gluten, and they were much higher in people with multiple sclerosis. These are antibodies associated with celiac disease, inflammation of the intestines in response to gluten. Also, it's known, not related to this study, that gluten activates zonulin, a protein in the intestines which regulates tight junctions between the cells, and this leads to increased intestinal permeability, perhaps contributing to the leaky gut syndrome. They also recommend avoiding dairy, milk, yogurt, ice cream, cheese, etc. The idea is molecular mimicry. There's a protein in milk, buterophilin, and it has a lot of similarities in structure to one of the proteins in myelin, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, or MOG. This is just part of the amino acid sequences of MOG and buterophilin. It's a big protein, but the entire protein has significant similarities. And you can see the underlying represents identical amino acids. And there are 20 different amino acids, so this is quite a significant similarity. There's also evidence that antibodies against buterophilin can cross-react against MOG. The idea is you consume dairy, your immune system develops antibodies against buterophilin, which accidentally cross-react against myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein and cause injury to the myelin. From an epidemiologic perspective, there's an association between milk consumption and MS. For instance, if you look at the top map, the prevalence of multiple sclerosis varies widely throughout the world and is much greater in certain areas, and it's kind of similar to this map of milk consumption per capita. Now, if I did this for wheat consumption, the association wouldn't be nearly as strong. Now let's move to the gut. This looks at various studies looking at the gut microbiome in people with and without MS. You can see the publication, the number of subjects, where it's taking place, and the changes in the gut microbiome they observe. And you can see all these studies show some sort of significant association with MS. Now, often it's different bacteria. It may depend on the location, the diet in that location, what bacteria are prevalent in that region, even the methodology they're using to culture the bacteria, I don't know. But it's very common to show some kind of clear difference between MS and people without MS. Even in the general population, yeast overgrowth of the gastrointestinal tract is common. This is not a study of MS, just the general population. And they looked at the percentage of people who had Candida albicans, a fungus, a yeast, in their stool. And you can see, regardless of age, it was around 80%, even people in their 20s. Now, some Candida may be okay, but sometimes it can overgrow. This photograph is a picture of the intestines with significant Candida overgrowth, which could change the function of the gastrointestinal tract. It's possible to measure the permeability of the intestines or the leakiness in an objective way using what's called the lactulose mannitol ratio in the urine. So you ingest lactulose and mannitol, and mannitol is a very small molecule. It gets into the bloodstream quite easily, even in a normal gastrointestinal tract. But lactulose should not get in as easily because it's a larger molecule. So its entry into the bloodstream and subsequently the urine suggests there's some kind of injury to the intestine. This is a study looking at multiple sclerosis versus healthy controls. They also looked at Sjogren's syndrome, a different autoimmune disease. And you can see people with these autoimmune disease were more likely to have an elevated lactulose to mannitol ratio in the urine after ingesting these compounds, suggesting leaky gut syndrome. Now, there's a lot of overlap between people with multiple sclerosis and controls, but on the average, there's a significant difference. So to put it all together, you have an abnormal gastrointestinal tract with increased permeability. You're ingesting foods which you may have a low-level allergic response to. Your immune system in the systemic circulation, as depicted in this diagram to the left, is now revved up. You have these T-helper type 1 
cells which are revved up, maybe even recognizing antigens in the central nervous system. They may release pro-inflammatory cytokines. There may be involvement in matrix metalloprotein ice 9, which damages the extracellular matrix of the blood-brain barrier, allowing these immune cells to get in more easily and target the central nervous system, causing the symptoms of MS. So this is what is recommended if you're following the best bet diet. As I explained, you would avoid dairy and gluten and avoid other potential allergens such as legumes and soy and anything that you're allergic to. They don't specifically exclude eggs or nightshade vegetables, but they do recommend formal allergy skin or blood testing. You would also avoid refined sugar. You would limit saturated fats and trans fats. You would eat only 20 grams a day of saturated fat, which is exactly what Dr. Roy Swank recommended after the first year, although he calculated saturated fat incorrectly. And so if you actually followed this, it's a very low amount of saturated fat. They say you can eat lean cuts of red meat up to twice a week, but only a very modest amount. And you could eat eggs in moderation, only two per week. They also recommend limiting, but not eliminating non-gluten grains. Gluten would be strictly eliminated. You would also limit omega-6 rich polyunsaturated oils like corn oil, sunflower oil, or other junk vegetable oils, but you could use extra virgin olive oil. So what would you actually eat? You would eat vegetables, fruits, fish, chicken and turkey along with nuts and seeds. And you would also limit salt. You would limit sodium to one gram per day. This is added sodium. Even a diet composed of entirely unprocessed foods has around two grams of sodium per day. You could drink wine and spirits in moderation, but of course, because it contains gluten, you would avoid beer. They give some suggestion for food substitutes. For instance, instead of cow's milk, other forms of milk are okay. Almond rice or coconut milk. For cheese, there is tapioca-based cheese substitutes. You couldn't have peanut butter because peanuts are legumes. You would replace this with almond butter or another nut butter. For flour, you could use gluten-free flour, though presumably in limited amounts. You're trying to avoid processed foods in general. And instead of salt, you could use potassium or dietary salt, herbs, spices, lemon pepper, etc. And instead of spaghetti or noodles, there are zucchini noodles, spaghetti squash, squash, or other vegetable substitutes. They also recommend supplements, including vitamin D3, 6 to 8,000 international units daily, and they recommend checking blood tests and trying to achieve a level of 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. Those are United States units. If you're international, it could be nanomoles per liter, which would be the equivalent of 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter. In the program Overcoming Multiple Sclerosis, they recommend a goal of 100 50 nanomoles per liter and 60 nanograms per milliliter. Those are the same, so it's pretty similar. They recommend omega-3 fatty acids, EPA plus DHA, or cod liver oil, calcium, magnesium, vitamin B complex, and a lot of probiotics, two capsules with every meal, and some optional supplements, vitamin A, B12, vitamin E, zinc, copper, selenium, iodine, or an alternative to fish oil, flaxseed oil. So in summary, the best bet diet is kind of like a hybrid between the swank diet, it has the low saturated fat component, and a paleo type diet, similar to the Walls protocol, though there are certainly some differences. There are many anecdotal reports of success with the diet, though to my knowledge, no published observational or randomized trials, so we don't know for sure if it works, though the advice is fairly conservative, certainly an improvement on the typical Western diet. I'd be interested to know, have you tried the best bet diet or something similar, and what were your results? And I'm always look on the lookout for video suggestions, so let me know if you have ideas in the comments below.